Um, you just come again. Or get I'll you, and then you'll, because that way I won't mess. Yeah, okay. And we'll cut off the beginning. Sh- okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. All right, now that we've got, like, become a big production, yeah. um, but now that the camera is ready to go, we're ready to go as well. So welcome everyone to uh, Duke ECE 490. Quite a lengthy title, I know. Um, so before I begin, I just want to introduce first off my co-instructor, Jeff Glass, or Dr. Glass. He'll be instructing next week because um, I'll, I'll be off in London attending a conference. Um, but then after that, I will be the primary instructor for this course. So if you have any questions, We've got all of our contact info here. We also have a TA, um, Akshay, and he'll be helping me out during office hours and during labs. So uh, I also sent out a number of emails and I'll walk through all of that. So we'll do the syllabus first and we'll do the lecture second. Um, So just a little bit of a background because I was actually floored by a lot of people's responses when we announced that we were gonna do this class. Like people were so excited that this class finally existed at Duke. So, you know, and since all of you are, majority of you are rising seniors, um, thank you for your responses and for c- making this class actually happen by signing up for it. Um, but part of the reason that this uh, class came to be was that both um, Professor Hutel as well as Professor Karen approached me last November when I came to participate on a ECE advisory board meeting. They said they wanted someone who had been an entrepreneur, had some level of success, and could share it with students. And so since I run my businesses remotely, um, I seemed like the most likely candidate. Uh, the other reason is that one of my businesses, Femgeneer, actually is focused on education services and we focus on providing tech professionals and tech entrepreneurs with education. So just kind of fit into the general theme. Um, to give you a little background about myself, I was a Pratt grad uh, 04, so it's been a little while, and it's fun to come back. Durham is definitely a much cooler city uh, than it was back in the day, so I'm excited about that, and Duke certainly has changed quite a lot, and I'm curious to see what the other changes are. When I left, actually in 04, my first job uh, was out in California, so I worked as an R&D engineer, and you know, maybe some of you will experience this in your career, but after two years of working in a big company, I wanted to have a slightly different experience. And so I actually started uh, Mint.com with another Duke grad, Aaron Passer. You might all be familiar with him as well. Um, he was class of 02. And the two of us started Mint. And if you're not familiar with Mint, it's a personal finance website. So it aggregates all of your checking, savings, student loans into one place so you get a good idea of where your money's going. Um, so we built the product, we started in technically the end of 05, beginning of 06, and then sold the company in 2009. And then after um, we sold it, I decided to go off on my own and start BusyBee. And BusyBee is a CRM solution for small businesses, particularly focused on fitness businesses. And then in the course of doing all this, I started blogging on Femgineer, and like I said, now it's become a second um, startup business that I run. So, like I said, let's start with the syllabus so that if you guys have any questions, you can ask and then we'll talk about um, the topic of today. So, I want to cover the syllabus because I have noticed all professors do that at the beginning of the (laughs) semester, so I'm just, bear with me. Um, The other other reason I bring it up is because I want to get a sense of who in here already has an idea, who doesn't have an idea, and who might already, um, if they do have an idea, be on teams so that for all of those who aren't, I can sort of focus my attention on those folks. Um, So the first thing is, you know the description and sort of the the objectives of this course, but what I want to highlight is that, first off, we're using this other site, so if you go to femgineer.com, Duke ECE 490L, you'll be able to access all the material for this course. So don't go to Sakai. Uh, If you go to Sakai, it'll direct you here, though. So Dr. Boss is going to make sure that there is a link, Um, but go here for all the information. Um, Second update is that I actually added one more book that you have to purchase. It's not expensive and it's a good read. Uh, It's this Lean Analytics book. So it's not in the Duke uh, bookstore, so you'll have to buy it online. 
but we're not going to deal with it until sort of the second half of the semester, so you've got some time to order it. Um, Mental Models is the one free book, so if you click on this link, it'll take you directly there, and then the other three books you should have purchased yourself. Uh, if you click on this, the links to each of the lectures, you'll get the slides, so in case you're wondering, I'll try to have the slides posted one day in advance, or at least the day of the lecture, so that you've got access to them. Um, and I know that there's a mix of Trinity and Pratt students, so who in here is in Pratt? Okay, and who in here is in Trinity? Okay, got it. Uh, and I'll, I also know that a lot of the Trinity students are computer science majors, so to me it's sort of the same. Um, <laughs> even if it's to you. Uh, so aside from the uh, lectures and the readings, you do have labs as well. The labs aren't going to meet every week, so please check on the syllabus for when the labs are going to meet. And right now we have a little bit of a lopsided lab schedule where there's 18 people or something like that in one section and five in another. Um, when you form into your groups, if the two of you are not, or the three, we'll cap the teams at three, um, if you're not in the same lab section, then I suggest that you do get in the same lab section so that it'll be easier to communicate with your, like with for me, <coughs> otherwise I'll have to repeat myself um, for your project. So I just advise you to switch over to the other lab section. If you have a conflict, then we can talk about it, but otherwise, let's try to get teams into the same lab. There will also be quizzes on the um, readings, and I will have them posted on here as well. You'll most likely do them either in the lab or in class, and uh, Akshay will help me administer them. And then the final thing is grades. So I know grades is a big deal. This is my first time teaching an undergrad class. I teach mostly adults where grades don't matter. Um, so I am coming up to speed, but Dr. Glass is definitely going to help me enforce. Um, I know that this might, be, this might seem like a simple class. I am going to aim for it to not be a simple class uh, for two reasons. The first is that entrepreneurship is by no means a simple endeavor, so I want to give you a realistic picture of that. Um, and then the second is that a lot of you have this idea that you want to take what it is that you're going to build in this class and actually go out and start a company, right? So I want to give you as realistic a picture and set you up for success as much as possible. So, you know, you took this class because you thought it was going to be easy. You know, there will be elements that are easier than solving differential equations and putting together circuits, but there will be elements of it that are much harder um, than you've experienced, like doing the presentations and thinking through the business plan and coming up with your pitch and even creating a simple prototype that customers are going to want to buy, right? So all of those things can be a little bit more tricky. Um, so we'll have class participation, and then, like I said, we'll have quizzes and, and labs, and then the final is you will have a business plan that you'll present. Uh, that'll be your final, and you can work on it within your group, but I will be grading all of you individually and your contributions individually. So you know, it can't be the sort of thing where one person kind of takes the whole uh, presentation and runs with it. I do want everyone to play a part. Um, and once again, this is to emulate what happens in the real world, which is each founder or co-founder of a startup um, has a certain role to play, whether they're the CTO or the C CEO or whatever their role is. So I'm going to hold all of you accountable in that manner as well. All right. So with that, get back. <coughs> so I've got on here listed goals and you know, unlisted goals. And so the... Um, the main goal is obviously to commercialize your idea, right? A lot of you wrote to me and said in your questionnaire that you had a specific product that you'd already built, a prototype, and you want to get it out there in the market. So that's definitely a goal. Um, and then of course, being able to do that, you need to understand how to do market research, and you want to be able to actually talk to customers, discover who they are, and then put a team together because no startup is just a one man or one woman effort. It is a, a, a team that makes or breaks it. Um, and then finally, you know, thinking about how you can make money off of this, right? Because that's what we're here to do. We're here to build a business uh, or fundraise. So those are all the goals that we want to accomplish in this class. But I have one unlisted goal for all of you, and that's to participate in the Duke Startup Challenge. How many of you here have heard of the Duke Startup Challenge? Okay, so everybody knows the Duke Startup Challenge. How many of you want to apply to be in the Duke Startup Challenge? Okay, so we're going to try to raise those numbers, right? <laughs> There's no reason why the work that you put into this class cannot directly apply to the Duke Startup Challenge. 
Um, the second reason is there's no reason why you shouldn't try to get 50K uh, in finding for your idea if you believe in it wholeheartedly, right? If you don't, that's a different discussion. But if you believe that your idea should be commercially viable and that you want to get some seed capital for it, then I would encourage you to apply. And throughout this course, I'll be sending out reminders. I'll be pointing out assignments that will, will directly link to what they're doing at the Startup Challenge because they've got a template that they've set up. So a lot of your assignments will fit into what they're looking for in terms of their rubric. Um, and then as we get kind of closer to some of their deadlines during office hours, I certainly encourage you all to come ask me questions on how you can refine your pitch. Um, but like I said, the goal is, the unlisted goal is that you know, each one of you should participate or each group should participate. Um, the other reason I say this is that the Duke Startup Challenge, I think, is a, once again a really great representation of what it's going to be like if you do decide to go out there and you know, start this company after you graduate. So use that again as a good test um, and don't just be like, hey, it's second semester senior year, I don't need to do this, right? Or just make that your only goal of <coughs> graduating uh, is to apply for the Duke Startup Challenge. Um, I may stick around for next semester and help participate. Uh, so there has been some discussion of that. Um, but regardless of whether I'm here or not, I want to help set you guys up for success. And so, you know, I'm going to keep reinforcing this. All right. So one last call. Um, if you click on this link, it'll, it'll give you all of the, you know, what it is that you need to do in order to apply. Um, it also has a really great set of resources that you can look at. There's a lot of templates. There's a lot of reading on there. Um, I would say get started early because I'm sure October 30th will just like be here tomorrow. So, you know, I'll encourage you and I'll certainly harass you about it. <laughs> okay, so getting started. I know the, the vast majority of you in here are engineers or have gone through Pratt um, and are ECECS. And so one of the things that I noticed about being an engineer and being an entrepreneur is that you get to have this very unique advantage of being able to think about things very systematically and very analytically. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. Um, the reason it's a good thing is that in a business you want to be able to anticipate a lot of different issues that come up, right? Whether it's who, how are people going to react to my product, what are all the different features of my product, you know, how might the market react to what I'm offering? What do I need to think about when I'm launching this, right? So you just anticipate a lot of corner cases. That's not to say that the students in here who aren't uh, engineers won't have <coughs> these advantages, but it's just to highlight that being an engineer certainly helps with it. Uh, the one major disadvantage, though, of being an engineer is sometimes you do think a little bit too logically, and you have to let things kind of bake for a while. Um, meaning that your product has to be out in the market for long enough. You have to actually market your product so that people know that it exists. Um, too often as engineers we think, well, if we just build it, then they will come, right? And that's not always the case. So there are some advantages, but there's also some disadvantages. Now, the other thing I'm going to highlight is, um, as I'm speaking, if you guys have questions, please interact, right? I'm counting class participation, so if there's things that are confusing, you want me to talk about more, I'm open to doing that. Okay, so today's topic is all about ideation. And the reason I start with ideation is that I know all of you have ideas, some of you don't have ideas, right? And so the reason you start with ideation is to actually highlight that there is a little bit of a process. It is not always a golden moment. Sometimes it is a golden moment of inspiration uh, that you might have, but not all times. A, a lot of times there's a, a few things that come together. The other reason that I talk about ideation is that a lot of times as a young entrepreneur, people have this idea that uh, their idea is what actually matters, when it's not all about that. A lot of it is about the quality, how, long, how big of a market you're going after, once again, how big of a team or how good of a team you have, uh, and then the execution itself, how committed are you to seeing it through and following through. So. You know, as engineers, one of the classic things that we like to do is we like to build, right? It's how we basically feel like we're making progress and we can show something, hey, we've you know, built a circuit or we've built a software program or we've built something physical. So I'm actually going to encourage you for the next couple weeks that you're in this class that you're not going to build anything. And you're actually going to be in an ideation mode 
for probably, like I said, the next two, possibly even three weeks. And the reason that I want you to think about resisting any urge to build your particular product, if you've already got a prototype that you're working on, is because I want you to, like I said, go through this ideation process with me. Now, the other is that sometimes when we are in this ideation phase, right, a lot of people call it a romantic period. And the reason they call it a romantic period is because you can imagine anything. And sometimes you can also get stuck in this period. So there will come a time where I will say, okay, enough of the romance, enough of ideation. Now you actually have to get out and try to create some, uh, some semblance of a product or at least get out there and talk to customers, right? So you can't get too hell-bent on brainstorming and ideation. Um, there does come a time we have to stick a fork in it. But for the time being, you know, enjoy this romantic period in terms of exploring what it is that you could possibly build. So, how many of you have read uh, the Lean Startup book? Okay, a few of you. So, um, then you're familiar with Eric Ries and basically what he says, which is that the value of a startup is actually validating learning, not the creation of stuff. Right? So that means what we're doing here is we're actually running a series of experiments and we're trying to learn from them. It is not that we're trying to build the best widget and try to, you know, make millions of dollars. That's a byproduct. Really what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what works and from that, continue doing it um, or change the process if things aren't working. And we do that when it comes to every single step, whether it's the ideation phase, whether it's the process of figuring out what the market is, who the customer is, building a prototype. Each of these cycles has an iteration cycle within it. So, in each phase, what we have to do is start with a hypothesis, right? This is why this is appealing to engineers, because we sort of break it down to more of the scientific method. So we're going to come up with a hypothesis, and our hypothesis could be anything. At Mint, our hypothesis was that people are not managing their finances because all the other products on the market are just crappy. And <laughs> I have to not curse in this class. <laughs> so, um, so given that that was our hypothesis, we had to go out and test it, right? So the first thing that we tried to measure was how many people would actually want to use a product like this. So we just conducted some experiments, and our experiment was to go out and talk to potential customers. We narrowed the scope of who those customers are to people that were 20 to 30, because at the time, we assumed that those are the people that are going to be the most responsive to a software product. And then from there, we were able to get we were able to have some learnings, right? And some of our learnings were that, yes, the vast majority of people that are 20 to 30 something don't like using existing products, but the other is that they don't actually like managing their finances. Um, now, they might not be as, I'd say, um, careful when it comes to security and things like that, like it doesn't bother them, um, but they want something that's simple and fast and easy to use. And so we then, in conducting these interviews, moved on to our next hypothesis, which is, can we build what it is that they want? Now, the other thing that we oftentimes deal with when we're talking about being in a startup or putting a new product out in the market is the level of uncertainty, right? There's always going to be uncertainty. And this, um, I see, is kind of the biggest challenge for a lot of young entrepreneurs. Because what happens is that the uncertainty starts to consume you. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, you don't know what's going on, you don't know what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. Um, and that's just the way it's going to be. A lot of times, that's the way it's going to be for a year, two years, sometimes even five years, depending on the type of product you're building. If you're building something like a medical device, or if something that's in a very highly regulated market where you have to do a lot of R&D or research, um, it's going to take a while before you can see the fruits of your labor, right? So all through that period, you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. And all you have to do is basically tell yourself that you have to embrace the uncertainty. Um, but there's techniques for how we can sort of mitigate the risk when it comes to this uncertainty. The second is we're dealing with limited resources, right? No startup starts fully funded with every person that needs to be on the team present and with customers knocking at their door. People who tell you that that was the case for them are most likely um, either inflating the story um, or you know, maybe they had had a couple startups in the past where they learned from and made some mistakes. But it is never the case that you have all the resources that you need right when you start. 
So this is the second thing that a lot of, like I said, young entrepreneurs struggle with is, I don't have the funding, I don't have the teammates, my co-founder just left, I don't have any customers, I don't know how to approach customers, people think of me as too young or uncredible, right? These are all things that people are going to say to you. And so all you can do to that is take the constraints of limited resources you have and make the best use of them. And once again, I know this is all very abstract, but over this course, it'll, it'll start to make more sense. So essentially what you end up having is a sort of balancing act where you're spending a lot of time learning, you're spending some time building, and then you're releasing your product or you're getting out there and whether it's a product, whether it's a marketing plan, whether it's a fundraise, you're then going and, and releasing whatever it is that you've built. Um, and then you're collecting feedback and you're going back again and applying the learning and building and refining, right? So there is this continuous cycle that you're going to be in. Um, and what you have to do is just start to embrace that cycle. Now, the other thing I'm going to say, because a lot of you in here have different ideas. Some have um, ideas for social enterprises, some for software products. I didn't hear, I didn't see anybody that had hardware products. Um, but it doesn't matter what kind of business or what kind of product you're building, these rules apply across the board. So I want you to get comfortable with that, right? I know you might say, well, this isn't going to work because I'm building a you know, denim jeans line or I'm building a software product. They're two different things. But the fundamentals are still the same. Yes, there are some areas that you have to dig into a little bit more than others, um, like mar when you talk about margins. Um, the margins are certainly going to be much higher in software than they are if you're building a physical product. We'll get into that. Um, but overall, these principles will apply to any kind of business that you decide to do. So, the purpose of this particular class is to help Goldilocks. And by that I mean, you know, a number of you said, I have a lot of ideas. I don't know where to start. I, I have so many and I don't know how to actually productize them or I don't know which one should take priority. Um, then there might be some of you who say I have no idea, I don't even know where to begin, what to do, I have no inspiration, uh, I can't figure out how to productize, but I'm just so curious about entrepreneurship, right? That's fine too. And then there might be some of you who say, you know, I've got an idea but I don't have customers, I don't have a co-founder, or I don't have a prototype. So I don't know if this is actually the idea I should be pursuing, right? So we're going to try to work through some of those issues. So the first is, where do ideas come from? Well, a lot of times we think, you know, these people are creative minds, right? They're just born as geniuses. And so given that, like, all the great ideas come from folks like this, right? No, you know, Joe Schmo walking down the street could come up with a brilliant idea. But if you look at all the products and all the businesses that are started, you know, people come from a lot of different walks of life and a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different professions. So it's not that, you know, there's one particular type of creative mind. So I want you to get rid of this notion that there is some sort of idea fairy that, you know, bestows upon some individual's ideas and then everyone else just, you know, gets stuck with what they get stuck with. The other reason I bring this up is a lot of times in ideation, what you need to do is you need to take stock of passions that you have. So, for example, when I started Busy Bee, um, I started doing a lot of research on voice recognition and on image processing. And I thought back to my signal processing class and I thought, you know, oh, this is like exciting, this is interesting stuff. But after about two weeks of reading white papers, I just got frustrated. I was like, this isn't going to get me out of bed. This isn't what I'm passionate about. So what are the things that I'm passionate about, right? So I took some time to take stock of what I was interested in and what would keep me going through the process. Like I said, many businesses take more than a year to get off the ground. Sometimes they take five or ten. The other thing that I thought about was what are some of the problems that exist in the market today? Right? What do people have pains in? And, and this is really critical because when you can mesh the passion you have with the pain someone else has, great things happen. And then I thought about what are some of the conversations or what are things that I've read, right? So it's this culmination of all these variety of sources that actually leads to an aha moment of having an idea. So once again, I'm going to remind you, don't jump into building, right? Just because you might have the idea, don't immediately say this is what the product's going to look like uh, or this is how the product should be, right? We're going to take a step back. We're going to focus just on the idea itself. 
So, the one thing when we talk about this notion of ideation and the philosophy behind it is to not fear thought crime. I know a lot of you in here, um, given the administration, might feel like, I don't want to share my idea with professors or other students because they're just going to take it and they're going to build the same thing. Right? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what happens if they build the same, if, if you build something great in a second. Um, but I would say to not fear thought crime, to actually talk about your idea, right? Hopefully, people would be supportive enough to give you some direction. Um, and if they're not, then they're not the right people to talk about your idea with. But don't fear this, I, this notion that people are going to want to steal your idea and then go off and build it. The second is that we don't take the time to put a team together. And the reason that we do this, we don't do this, is because we think, well, you know, my idea is so great, I'm so great, and therefore I'm capable of building this all on my own. The truth is, nobody is capable of building anything on their own uh, to a certain extent, right? You might be able to build a prototype, <coughs> you might be able to do some fundraising, but at a certain point, if you're really going to take this product and move from an early adopter market into a mainstream market, or try to scale it into a business, you're going to need to have some other folks on your team. And so one of the things that I talk about in doing this ideation, in this process, is to start by making a list of mentors. People that you think could actually add value to you. The second is to talk to potential teammates, whether it's your peers or people even outside. Um, I just had a conversation with a 17-year-old a couple days ago, a uh, brilliant young girl who, you know, unfortunately her brilliance is beyond the scope of high school because she's already built this app in like five different languages and she's trying to help the blind and you know her biggest gripe is she's doing all of this on her own. So I said, well, you need to get out and find adults or college students that can help you out, right? So a lot of times you might not be in the right ecosystem, but you have to get out and find those who are. Now, the other thing is talking to experts. So when I mention this to people, they're like, well, you know, I'll send an email and I'll get rejected by someone, an expert, whether it's a someone who's a, got a doctorate, or someone who's a CEO of a company, or someone who's built a similar product, um, or you know, just another big company that you'd like to partner with, right? So yes, you can expect to get rejected. And the reason you can expect to get rejected is because you're just getting started. And they're not 100% sure you're committed to your idea, right? So the key is when you're thinking about put, putting these experts, you know, per, perhaps making them advisors, you need to think about keeping a longer term relationship with them. Meaning, you send out that initial email, or you send out that first phone call and say, hey, look, you know, this is just the start. Um, I know you might not have time to meet with me, but I'm going to keep sending you updates and milestones of what I've accomplished. And over time, people see that you are committed and will then help. So just something to keep in mind when you get that first rejection letter, or if you don't hear back at all. Now, the other thing to think about is influencers. Now, the reason I bring up influencers is because these folks are <coughs> kind of like experts. But the distinction is that they're going to be someone who's going to evangelize whatever your product is, right? So think of it as you're building um, the next generation of iPhone and you want Kobe Bryant to be your endorser, right? He's an influencer. So it's going to take a while to get him to say yes to endorsing your product, plus a lot of legal work. Um, <laughs> but you want to start thinking about who these people are and how you could start to make friends with these influencers. And it doesn't always have to be someone as glamorous as, as that, right? You can start maybe with Coach Krzyzewski first and move up from there, right? But think about your, your you know, tiers of influencers. Now, the third thing I'll mention is to not fall in love with your idea. And this is probably the hardest, right? Once again, because your young mind and you'll fall in love with the first idea that comes along your way. Um, but like I would say is, you need to actually think about the process of generating your idea. The other is, a lot of times that first idea is, no matter what you think, is actually a really crappy one. And the reason it's crappy is because it's not fully thought out, and it's coming just from you rather than having a few other inputs. And you might not also have thought through how you can mass market it, right? It might be something very, very specific, um, like beneficial to just Duke students rather than the rest of the world. So this is why I say, you know, take your idea, but don't fall in love with it. Think about more about the process. And then finally realize that it's going to evolve, and that it's okay if it evolves. A lot of times people become these control freaks, where they're like, no, this is exactly how the idea is, this is my vision, and this is what we're going to build. And that doesn't always end up the case. A lot of the best entrepreneurs I've seen have said, well, this is the overall vision, 
but I'm going to let my team execute on that and let them go in some various ways. So coming back to, once again, this idea of thought crime, I want to emphasize uh, why it is that you should tell people your idea. Well, the first is that I would actually encourage you, if you think you have this brilliant, earth-shattering idea, to go out and tell another company about it. Right? Get them to steal your idea. And the reason I say this is because a lot of times they'll be like, who is this kid from Duke? Why should I even bother reading this email? Or maybe they'll give you the benefit of the doubt and they'll say, okay, I'm going to read this email, but then realize that they're going to have to go through a lot of either bureaucracy or a lot of different steps in order to copy your exact idea or actually implement it, right? So, so there is a level of effort on their part. Now, the second reason I bring this up is that if your idea is really good, someone's going to steal it at some point in time, whether it's now or five years from now, right? How many people remember all the Groupon clones that came out just a few years ago? Right? It was like, you know, just wildfire. So that's why I say the key is not to think about, you know, I'm going to hold my idea and I'm not going to let anybody have access to it or share it with anybody, but that I'm going to do my best to become the market leader. And to become that market leader, it means that you've got to have the best team, not the best idea. And also means that you have to understand the market that you're in uh, and make progress in it. So the reason that we were really successful at Mint in becoming that market leader is we had a really good team. We didn't hold on to this notion of, you know, we're going to have our idea just be amongst ourselves, right? We get, got out and shared it. We shared it with potential investors, with employees, and with customers. So, the other thing when we talk about ideation is to think about whether you have an invention or a reinvention. Now, this is a little bit of a subtle concept. And by invention, I mean you actually are creating some sort of brand new technology, right? Let's say you're doing stem cell research or you want to um, come up <coughs> with the next wave of transistors or no longer vacuum tubes. Right? But, but in the old days, transistors were a very new form of technology, and people had to find applications for them. Same thing with the incandescent light bulb. That was a new form of technology. It was displacing candles and uh, oil lamps and things like that, right? So these are all new forms of technology or new inventions. So when you go down this path, you have to understand that there are going to be some limitations and that you're going to have to figure out how you can actually transform it into a commercially viable product. Does this make sense to people? Okay. Now, the second is you're doing a reinvention. And by reinvention, I mean you're already taking an existing product, right? And it's perfectly fine to go down this path. But you're taking an existing product, kind of like we did at Mint, uh, where we took the product Quicken that was in the market and applied a better skin and made it more user-friendly. Another is Tesla with the hybrid, right? Cars have existed for 100, for 100 years now. Um, but basically, Elon Musk is transforming the industry by creating a hybrid. Now, another is, of course, Twitter, right? Telegrams and SMSs have existed for a while. So with this notion of reinvention, you're not really doing a whole lot in terms of inventing a brand new technology, right? You're taking existing products and maybe applying some new technology to them. And the other thing is when you do this reinvention, um, it's, it's actually a great place to start because there's a lot of existing behavior, right? People were already managing their finances. People are already driving cars. People are already sending text messages and telegrams, right? Short form of communication. So you don't have to get over this bigger hurdle of change of behavior when you do a reinvention. When you do an invention, you do have to get over that change of behavior and a little bit more. Uh, and I'll explain what that little bit more is. So, when you do a reinvention, when I said you have to do a little bit more work, you have to think about what are the limitations of this new technology, right? So, uh, how many of you are familiar, uh, what is it called, um, when USBs came out? They were born. <laughs> so anyways, this was, a, this was a fairly new form of technology, right? Before then, people were using these things called uh, floppy disks, and you really weren't born then. Um, but, but, you know, they basically have to put all their data on this disk, and then they have to, like, stick it in the drive and all of this, right? But when this USB came around, it was a completely new technology, right? It wasn't the floppy disk, it wasn't the magnetic tape. It was more of, like, a flash drive. 
right? So this was a fairly new um, technology, and you know, in both cases, they had some limitations, right? The case of the USB was they had to operate, have backwards compatibility. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. So a lot of people had to upgrade their machines. Um, the other is people had to even understand the application of USB uh, compared to floppy, which is you know quicker file transfers uh, versus putting an entire file on a, on a floppy or hard drive. So the other reason you want to think about invention is if it's if it's going to be a new technology, right, uh, or if it's based on an existing technology, why might this be so popular? How how could we make this popular, right? What might be an application of it? And then what are its limitations? So in the case of the incandescent light bulb, you had to put in a lot of wiring into homes and offices and all this stuff before we could actually have <coughs> you know, electricity. The other thing that we want to think about when we think about new forms of technology is how is it going to outperform existing technology? <laughs> and this is oftentimes something that people don't take the time to think about because they're just so excited <coughs> about whatever it is they're building, right? But the reason we bring it up is, is it going to save people time and money? Is it going to take up less space? Is it going to be more reliable or have a longer life or a higher quality? Or is it going to help us you know, build a more um, sustainable environment? Right? There are all these different applications. So when we think about a new invention, we have to think about how is it going to benefit? And that's, of course, sort of the role of engineers, right? Is to think of an application and how it will benefit humanity. Now the other, which I mentioned before, is what's going to limit it from becoming popular, right? So we might have this great idea, but we might not be able to actually implement it. So think again to Tesla. I actually recently found out that, um, I don't know if this is true or not, I'll have to double check, but that Tesla is outlawed in the state of North Carolina, um, not because of the technology, uh, but because of the fact that you know, Tesla wants to have its own showroom, so it's a distribution model. Um, where it's like Apple and it has its own retailers. And so apparently in the state of North Carolina, um, you can't have your own, you can't have exclusively your own retailer. You have to allow for uh, other dealers to distribute your cars. And since Tesla won't allow that, apparently they won't allow them to distribute Teslas in North Carolina. Now, I saw one on the road the other day, so I don't know how much of this is folklore. I will double check. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because there may be things like regulations that are holding you back from actively distributing your new technology. Now, the other case is you might just have to do some additional R&D to actually you know, make it into something that's mass market. A lot of times when we start with a new technology, it might work for a handful of users <coughs> or a very particular scientific use case but it might not be the sort of thing that we can mass produce. So we have to think about how we're going to actually mass produce this. Um, the, other, uh, so the other is thinking about infrastructure, right? Like I said, um, not only with Tesla is it an issue of the dealers, but you have to have these recharging stations, right? And I know, I think it was last year that they finally started to put recharging stations, but still, you know, people were getting a little bit nervous about whether they could drive far enough to get to a recharging station. So think about, is your technology going to require some additional infrastructure? Same thing with things like solar panels, right? People have to have certain types of homes in order to install them. And then the final thing that we oftentimes discount when we talk about invention versus the reinvention case is a change of behavior. Are people going to have to think differently? Are they going to have to do things differently? Are they going to have to buy things? And a lot of times, this, more than anything else, barring regulations, um, becomes the biggest hurdle for adopting it. So this is something you want to think about as you're thinking about your idea, right? What, what are people going to have to fundamentally change in order to use this? So a very simple example was, you know, the airline industry um, back in the day. A lot of people were afraid to fly for very good reasons, right? It was a brand new technology. Who in their mind wants to get in a metal can and then crash moments later, right? So it took a little while for people to get used to this idea of, okay, there's going to be a change in behavior. I'm going to have to get comfortable with this idea of it being a risk. Um, to, to some extent, you know, it became safer and safer over the years. But for a lot of times, people were, you know, had this idea that, no, I'm only going to drive my car or I'm going to, you know, go on a sailboat to get anywhere. 
So it was a drastically um, different change of behavior for people to get used to in terms of transportation. And a lot of it was fear, right? This fear of I'm going to die. So when we talk about reinvention, it's a little bit different. And one of the exercises that I want you to go through if you are thinking about going down this case of reinvention is to list five things that you've got to improve. You know, I don't care if it's not truly technical um, for the purposes to go through the exercise, but I'm sure there's been something that has bothered you, um, like the settings in this room for me at least, uh, where you've thought of improving it, right? And so it can be something very, very basic. But, you know, as you're going through this next couple of weeks, Think of all the little frustrations that you might have with whatever product you're using and how you might be able to improve it. And then, once you've done that, think about other people who might have faced the same pain that you do. Right? And this is, the, this is the important part if you're going to mass produce a product. is It can't just be about you, it has to be about others. So who else might have faced the same problem? And then, you want to think about, well, have they tried to solve this pain themselves before? And what are some of the solutions that they might be using? Right? And so when you do this, you're going to have to make a list of the things that rock about the solutions they're already using and the things that suck. So when we did this at Mint, one of the things in the rocks category of existing products was that people felt like it was really secure, had a lot of features, came from established companies. Things that sucked about it were just so damn hard to use or it didn't really give them all the information that they wanted in an easy format. Right? So, so think about both categories. And then think about what might be some other pains that are related. Right? So in, in our case, it was managing your personal finances, setting up a budget, knowing how much money you have. All of these are related issues. So next we're going to talk about some techniques for how you can go about actually you know, doing your ideation process. How many of you are familiar with mind mapping? Oh gosh, no. Okay, that's great. So I can teach you something new. So mind mapping is basically that you know, kind of fun activity. It's meant to be fun. So what you do is you have this visual outline of information. And the reason that you do this is so that you have a brainstorming session with yourself. And like I said, it's that romantic period, right? So you take whatever your idea is and you try to go to the far ends of the earth of what it could become. Right? So you kind of have to stretch your imagination. And so when we do this mind mapping technique, we usually do it one to two hours. Like I said, you want to start off by yourself before you do it in a group. And the key is to not judge any of your ideas. Right? Too often we, we judge because we think it's not feasible. So instead, this is a little bit of a different mindset where you're going to say, this is feasible, right? Obviously, if we can put a man on the moon, if we can um, clone a sheep, then there are certain things that are within the bounds of what we can accomplish, right? So I want you to feel the same way. Now, of course, you know, take your time and, and don't rush, but make sure you capture all of the ideas and all of their connection points. Now, this isn't productizing your idea. This is purely brainstorming. So I don't want you to say, this is going to be a software product, this is going to be a hardware product, this is going to be a mug, this is going to be a pair of jeans, right? I want you to instead just think about all the ideas that you have. So here's an example, just to give you uh, concrete. Um, so I did this about a year ago for my business, Femgineer, when I was getting started. And like I said, the purpose of Femgineer is we're an education service and we help tech professionals and tech entrepreneurs. And so what I did was I took stock of all the different things I had in place. So I had a blog, I had some education, and I did some consulting. And then I thought about, okay, well, you know, what is it in the blog that we want to actually talk about? Um, so what really seems to work for, for people or they're interested in is entrepreneurship or engineering. A lot of people like to talk about spotlighting women. And then on the education side, I thought about, well, you know, how are we going to actually distribute this education? What's going to be appealing to people? And what we found is that people actually wanted to, you know, get this education online, but a lot of people wanted to get it offline. So when we did online, we noticed that, well, social media worked in recruiting people. So we used tools like Twitter and Facebook and WordPress. When we did it offline, we went to a number of co-working spots, because that's where everyone was hanging out, that were started to be tech people. 
Um, and then the same thing for consulting, right? What kind of consulting do we want to do? Do we want to do business or do we want to do engineering? Right? So this just gives you an idea of how we did the mind mapping. It doesn't have to be this pretty by any means or this organized. It can be more disorganized, but I just wanted to give you an idea. So we're not actually ending early because we do have another exercise, but I'm going to review what we talked about here. So we talked first about ideation, right, and what ideation means. Um, it's basically the process by which you come up with ideas. And that means you have to take stock of your passions, your interests, conversations that you've had with people, right? And it's not this fairy that's going to come and suddenly deem you with an idea. Um, the second thing we talked about is the invention versus reinvention, right? And so this notion of invention is you're coming up with some brand new form of technology. And if you're going to do that, then you'll have to deal with change of behavior, but you'll also have some other hurdles like the fact that you might be in a heavily regulated market, um, you might have to do more R&D, or you might have to put in infrastructure. Uh, then we talked about reinvention, where there's already a product or there's already a behavior that people are familiar with, and you're simply improving upon that, right? The case I gave you was Twitter, for example, with SMS, Tesla with a hybrid car. And then talked about thought crime, how you shouldn't be afraid of it, um, that you should be able to share both with your peers and professors. And the truth is that if you have a good idea, it's going to be copied at some point. Um, it's really up to you to continue executing um, and become the market leader. And then finally, we concluded with this, like, with this technique of mind mapping. And in the next class, I'll teach you a couple other techniques. This is meant to be a pretty simple technique. Okay, so now what we're going to do is, um, first, I have to learn all of your names. Uh, and second, um, I know a number of you came into the class with an idea, right? So whoever came in, you know, when you filled out that questionnaire, you said, I have an idea. Maybe over the summer it's no longer an idea, which is fine. Uh, or maybe it's more of an idea. Um, so I want all of those who have an idea to get on this side of the room. Yes, you're going to have to move. You're all young and capable, so I'm sure you can get a move. And then those who don't have an idea to get on this side of the room. <laughs> and if you already have your team, then like hang out in your teams, like you know, your interesting freshmen hanging out together. Okay, so all of you don't have ideas. Oh, wow. You have an idea. Okay, that's fine. Do you have one or do you not have one? Okay. Alright. So all you people without ideas, hush. And then all you people that do have ideas, um, let's Ladies first, so uh, your name uh, and then what your idea is. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anna. I'm currently a senior at Duke, and my idea is essentially um, using personalized genomics to figure out um, to create um, custom customized workouts for people. Okay, great. Um, I'm Omar, and. My idea, well, I said something else in the class. That's okay. But <laughs> Ideas can change and evolve. Uh, and so um, my idea is with plants who is coming back from the Philippines, so you should be familiar okay. with you, Thursday, but um, it's to engage communities to celebrities within that community. Okay. So a lot of us are inspired by certain people, and whether you do it or not unconsciously, always following certain people, reading content, so it's basically consuming content. To from these well-known personalities as well as having users, users generate their own content okay. and sort of bringing that together, engaging communities and help bring them closer. Got it. Okay. Are you all a team together? With two of us. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Julian. Sorry, I'm Mr. I'm Glenn. I'm a senior. Glenn. Okay. 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 And, and I'm Julian. Julian. And we've been working on an app called Thursday. Uh, we kind of like to think of it as the social network for people who actually want to go out and you know, do social things, meet up with their friends and stuff. So. Okay. Got it. Uh, so I'm Alex. I'm working on a startup called Turnout. Um, I was in San Francisco working full time on it. 
Uh, we do demographic targeting mostly for e-commerce sites. Okay. Uh, so the basic idea is uh, changing your site to appeal to each individual visitor based on their demographics. Uh, so we've got a product and a handful of customers so far. So just looking on iteration and getting more customers. Got it. Okay, great. All right. So, um, how many of you would like help with your idea? And if you don't, just say no. <laughs> right? We have to be very firm here. So, okay, you want help? I mean, it's going to be a full-time partner, though. As far as uh, okay. Well, uh, well, we'll talk about what full-time <laughs> means and how a partnership should evolve. But that's, that's fair enough. It's good to get commitment from people. Okay. So mine is like really early stage. Is this because I feel like the market's not ready for like that doesn't matter. All I'm asking my, my question is, do you want help? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So who in here wants help on the idea side? So we would we would certainly That's be okay. open to help. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're a final grade is gonna rely on this, right? So choose yeah. wisely. If you open to the first day, we'd love to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> That's good. No, it's fine. It's okay. So we've got a you better be committed if you're gonna join. Um, a we're open for the right person. And then you've already got you guys okay, he's already got a team, so he's taken. And then um, Anna, you're also open to having somebody work with you. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any other restrictions? Um, it's okay to have <laughs> restrictions. <laughs> so, you know. Okay. I'm like, I know, I'm CS in bio, so if you know CS, you get assistant, things like that, would be awesome. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Setting up some requirements. Okay. All right. So not that you all have to rush over there, but I'm just pointing this out. So there are three teams of people if you wanted to <coughs> join. Um, looks like there's possibly two people that can join this, only one here and two here since I don't want the teams to be more than three. Okay. So existing ideas that you can help with. Um, and then all of you that don't have an idea, um, I have basic, so really you don't have any idea. How many? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'd rather just send out the questionnaire the day before the class starts rather than you know, when you register. Um, okay, so how many of you in here feel at least 90% confident that in the next two weeks they can come up with their own idea? Okay, it seems like 100% of you would have raised your hand. Okay, so I have two requirements if you're going to do this, right? Um, the first is that once again you form no more than a team of three, and the second, um, and, you know, I've heard mixed reviews on this, um, but I, I would actually encourage you to not make something that is Duke centric. It's okay to take inspiration from Duke, um, but I, I still encourage you to not. Um, and part of the reason I'm saying to not is because it's going to fit into the criteria of the Duke Startup Challenge if you do decide to go there. They're looking for big ideas. So if you make something like an app for the bus system, well, that's fine. I think it already exists. Uh, <laughs> right, apparently it took a long time to get that in place. Um, but I would say, you know, think of it not as an app for the Duke bus system, but how would you make it for, you know, all cities all over the world, right? That, that's a big idea. Um, or mass transit, right? So. The reason I say this once again is it's fine if you have if you want to come up with your own idea. Now, it will give you a deadline, um, which will be basically by the time I get back. So by the time that I get back, which is the 9th, if you don't have an idea, then you'll have to come to office hours and we'll have to talk about giving you one. Okay? Is that fair? Okay. So by, that, by the two-week mark, the 9th, um, you should not only have your idea, but your team picked out of who you're going to work with. Okay, and I will let you all assemble um, individually so that you don't have to feel like uh, I'm going to force you into... But remember, your final grade will depend on all of your peers. This is like, I don't know how many of you take CPS 108. Yeah. Uh, Three of them. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, it's kind of like that where... Yeah, I'm accurate with this because it's like... Of course. Okay. So any other questions from the no idea camp? Yeah. If we know the general area that we want to go into, uh, can we finish up? Can we what? Can we can I present a little? Yeah, sure. Uh, does anybody want to work on big data and natural language processing with me? Wait, for what's like your idea? No idea. I just that's the area I want to explore. <laughs> does anybody want to do it with me? Well, mine involves like a lot of big data as well. Yeah. We shall talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
do we have to have like like we have an idea but have like zero pop that skill? Like, well, there's not going to be. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's not going to. This, this pop, you're not going to actually build a, an actual prototype. Right. But if, you know, thinking a little bit ahead of ourselves, because um, that's something that you need to get comfortable with. You know, if this is something that you want to take and run with for the Duke Startup Challenge or for when you graduate, then I would advise you to pick people who at least have some of the uh, skills, characteristics of people that you'll eventually want to work with in the future. Right? I'm not saying that, you know, this is now a marriage and you are forever, you know, beholden to each other. Uh, but my point is, you know, take this as a good exercise, a practice, if you will, of the type of you know, people that you want to work with and the skills that they need to have, or at least interests that they need to have, right? So for the next semester, are you uh, at all interested in the same idea that they are? And if you're not, then, you know, pick something else. Right. Uh, mind you, you're also free to work on this alone, but I would encourage you, once again, to not, um, because, like I said, you'll, you'll get stuck very often. Um, so, you know, if possible, find at least one other teammate. That isn't me. <laughs> um, are we, so we're talking about literally anything. Like nothing is, is out of bounds. So it can be anything from like an app to um, an item to a social enterprise. Yes. So, you know, given the spirit of the class, I would say either a tech product or a tech-enabled business. Okay. And by tech-enabled business, Really what I mean by that is you need to be leveraging the internet for your initial distribution. Okay. Okay, what, what, what you do beyond that is up to you, but you know, most, most businesses today, whether they're selling jeans or software, have some form of software you know, involved in the process. Um, so that's why I say tech-enabled business. Okay. But yes, you're, you're fine to do it. And yes, you can have either a social enterprise, um, a non-profit or a for-profit. That doesn't matter. Um, next week when we talk about IT and the third week when we talk about setting up corporations, then you can decide what kind of entity you want to set up, um, but you're certainly free to, to do that. Yes? What is Duke's involvement or ownership if what is worked on here? You will find out next week. Okay. Dr. Glass will... Well, let me, let me give you a 30-second yeah. thing right now. Um, you know, there's an official um, Duke policy that as as members of the Duke community that goes through their mm -hmm. their uh, intellectual property office. But the stance for all classes so far has been it's a class, it's not using a research lab. So I guess the key message to send out this you know today is if you're thinking about an idea that's going to use a research lab or intellectual property in a lab at Duke, then you really have to go through our office of, of sponsored programs. So if you're not, then it's just in the classroom, it's you guys in your dorms, and then you don't worry about it. Yeah. That's, the, that's the practical side, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, and even in that case, we'll still help you. Like, we don't want to dissuade you from pursuing research projects. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, when I say you have to go through that office, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a, a useful thing, but it does, it does add a layer of administration. And, but if they like the idea, then they can help you patent it, too. Uh, I apologize if you mentioned this before, but is there like an official forum or mailing list for us to like talk to each other? Yeah. Uh, oh, is that the, the email invite? Yeah, you should have gotten it. Is it the Google group? I'm just going to bring it up again. You can go on Sakai now and you'll see the Google group link to it. Yeah, it's, um, it's this Duke ECE 490L at Google Groups. Can we change the email that we have on that? Yes, you have to send me a request. Okay. I think some people, some people have already done that, but yeah, you can just um, re request it, or email, if, you, if you don't know how to do that, then just email me directly, and I'll change the email address. I'll send you a new invite. Can you yeah, no, no. yeah, go ahead. Can you touch on the my balsamic thing that you invited us to? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, I was going to wait till next the next class, but we've got time now. Um, so there's going to be a number of tools that you're going to use in this class. Um, Balsamic is one of them. It's a wireframing tool. So what that means is you're going to create mock-ups. Um, what that means is you're going to create some prototype, like paper designs, the schematics of your product. Uh, and then you can use that to show to potential customers and get feedback. 
Um, so the MyBall comic is, is that prototyping tool. Um, and I created a space for us. I, I think I have to set up individual projects on there. Right now there's just one project that's like do PC 490. Um, but eventually <coughs> each one of you will have your own project space. So you can go on there and your lab one is to create a sample mock-up of your own on it. Any other questions related to tools? Okay. Can I, can I emphasize one thing? Um, you know, this, uh, don't apologize for an early stage venture or an early stage idea. Everything starts somewhere. And it, you know, the earlier you start with the idea, the more passionate and more bought in you will become to that idea. But I think the message really is pick something you really like Pick something that you're passionate about. Don't try to pick something because it's further along or because you see that it's you know, got more legs. I would pick it because you love to study it, because it's hard. And if you pick something that you don't really love, it's really, really hard, right? And uh, the only other thing is that um, I think in this class and, and as you talk to each other, make sure that you're following this great advice of share your idea. Many more ideas die because they are withheld than die because they are stolen by another group. So you'll find that if you share the idea, and this is the case with knowledge in general, if you share the idea, it generally gets better and better and better. If you withhold it, not only do you lose the opportunity of finding good customers, but you lose the opportunity to improve the idea. Now, your patent attorney is going to tell you I'm an idiot, okay? So be real careful when you talk to your patent attorney to understand what the limits are on that. We'll talk a little bit about that next week on how you talk about it without losing your patent rights. Um, but still, don't hold it back, and I would say especially in this case, unless you know you're really far along with something, keep in mind that sharing it's going to make it a lot better, and, and that usually they'll die because you don't share it as opposed to because you share it. Um, one other thing piggybacking off of Dr. Glass is don't come up with something to impress us also. Uh, so, you know, if you, have, if you have something that you might think is basic, it's okay to pursue something that's basic. Uh, when I started building yoga software, people were like, what? But then they saw that our competitor had, you know, $50 million in revenue for this market. So clearly there's some potential there, right? So don't discount it just because you might feel like, oh, it's not the most glamorous or it's, like I said, a basic. Um, so you don't have to go out and pursue something that's hard for a researcher or very, very um, challenging. But like I said, at least think about it being in a big market. Any other questions? Okay. Should we introduce ourselves? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Yeah, why don't you get started? Uh, sure. My name is Andrew. Do you have any particular information? that you want, like senior? Yeah, sure, just, uh, yeah, and then if you're in Pratt or Trinity. Okay, I'm in Trinity, major in public policy. Um, good to know you. <laughs> and then if you have, if you have an inkling of an idea, you um, that as well. No, I'm pretty open to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of my thought has been on uh, social venture, but um, I'm very open. Okay. Yellow t-shirt. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Bruce. Uh, I'm a junior. I think the only junior here. There was a sophomore that signed up as well. Okay, cool. Um, I'm a free agent. Uh, <laughs> dual majoring in ECE and CS and looking to get my master's degree in engineering management in my fifth year here. Uh, we'll see if that goes well. <laughs> sure, Dr. Lass can steer you in the right direction for that. Stripe shirt. <laughs> a second striped shirt, yeah. Um, on that, um, I guess I will be a sophomore. I took uh, time off, well, originally in the senior class, but um, I'm majoring in public policy and I'm open to ideas. Okay. Um, my name is Nikhil and I'm just. No, you're fine, go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a senior studying electrical engineering and I'm also open to ideas. But I have some thoughts, but nothing substantial. Okay. And, and for those of you that, you know, where you're like, uh, I'm not sure, uh, what I'll do is I will um, hold office hours this Thursday, and you can come and talk to me about it then, um, and then you can certainly post it on the, the groups as well, so that we can flesh this out. It doesn't have to be like, oh, at the end of two weeks, uh, I don't have anything, right? We can sort of work together over the course of the next two weeks to formulate it. So I'll be, I'll be prepared for them. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it's 3591. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Jaren. I'm a senior, majoring in economics and math, and 
and uh, hope the is as well. <laughs> I'm Brad, I'm a senior in ECE, and I have no interest. <laughs> uh, Darnesh, senior in ECE, um, a couple thousand, but nothing in concrete. Okay. Um, the bank, uh, senior in public policy, and I definitely have a specific idea. Okay. I'm Joe, a uh, senior in GISCON, and I just thought of some ideas, but I haven't thought about them in a while. So. Okay. Um, I'll be <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Harris, <coughs> I'm a student here at EC Um, I have a kind of random idea that I've ignored for a while, but I might do it, um, which would be installing like fruit and vegetable washing machines in supermarkets. So you don't have to watch them yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure if I want to do that. No, I'm kidding. There's no judgment here. Right? We are, we are in the, we're in the romantic period. Okay. Yes, the key word here. I would like to say that I'm pretty on the film major, ECC, and I will do I'm Zach. I'm also a senior at ECCS. And I'm looking to do something self-related, but nothing concrete does it. Um, I'm Connie, I'm a senior majoring in economics and linguistics. I'm actually working on a hardware project in Boston, so I want to look at something else, like software related, but I don't know how to code or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no requirement for this class. And I'm Carell, and I'm a senior, and I'm just a comp uh, major, and I generally just want to explore like the natural language processing slash big data um, field. Okay. Got it. Um, so, we have a couple more minutes. If you didn't have an idea, why was, what was the major reason for taking the course? We had an idea, but it died. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Learn product development. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I think senior year is a good time to think about future plans. You okay. Can create your own future plans. Sure. <laughs> okay. Any other? Reason? I think um, part of the thing I was kind of just more interested in is learning kind of how you were talking about like a little bit of a process behind it. Sure. And I think sometimes you know people kind of just like, oh, it's going to strike me one day that this is a problem I want to fix, but mm -hmm. I kind of want to approach it in a little bit more of a structured manner. So that's possible. Okay. Yeah, uh, similar to that, <coughs> going through the process of thinking of an idea to actually giving a pitch for, for that once mm -hmm. you build that business plan. Good. Okay. Anybody else? Nothing else? I guess if you have an idea, or even if you don't, but uh, yeah. it's more like learning what else goes, what everything, like the entire process of forming a company is not just the product itself, but like the marketing and everything else, like you said. Okay, yep, the, the rest of the infrastructure that you have to build up, okay? I also, just to add, I also feel like there's a lot of really talented people here, and I think. Uh, will like graduate not having met them and I think that's kind of a shame. So yeah, like, that's so a very like, good point. You guys are all really great. Well, you never know also when, right? So for example, Aaron and I graduated in completely separate years yeah. um, and then came together to start Mint, right? So yes, there is a very strong network here. Um, I know other founders as well uh, on the West Coast that have gone their separate paths after graduation and then came together later on um, as do graduates and you know did problem sets together and kind of knew each other's general habits so they were able to form like a good partnership. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is definitely a great place to start thinking about that. Um, meaning, you know, how do you form your team and getting that practice. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely good. All right. Any anything else? You've got a great diversity in the class, so think about how to make use of that. And, and don't think about, you know, that you've got to know the technology. Think about somebody's got to know the customer. Somebody's got to know the application. You've got some policy people in here. There's got to be some really yeah. interesting outlets for, you know, what, what is needed in the realm of policy that, you know, needs a technology solution. So think about it broadly, especially since you don't have to actually deliver the technology for the class. So you can be a little more... Uh, how do you say, you know, risk taking in that sense. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. So don't, this isn't going to become a Trinity Craft battle. Uh, <laughs> and as somebody who has been in both colleges, um, I will say, you know, they both have their equal weight. So yeah, I would say make sure that your team isn't too 
um, tech heavy or too business heavy and try to create a little bit of harmony within the, the team and that's why having things like requirements and constraints and who it is you'll work with and won't is good you know try to be a little bit more open um, but obviously have the things that you won't negotiate on um, when you form your teams and I will keep kind of drilling this into you because the team is is very important um, you might not think it right now, and you might also think, well, if my co-founder leaves, it's the end of the day, but that's not also the case, right, or the end of the world. It's not the case. But good team <coughs> formation is important um, in terms of, like Dr. Glass said, the diversity of ideas, but also pulling this through and, and making it into something that's actually viable. <coughs> All right, any other questions? Any questions about the syllabus? Is there a live tomorrow? No, so there's no labs this week. Next week, uh, the, there is a lab that you're going to do on your own, and then I think the first lab is on the September 11th. So that's why I said check the schedule. There's only six or I think maybe seven now um, labs throughout the course of the semester. Okay. Oh, and remember, like I said, if you're not in the same lab as your teammate, try to get into there before drop add. When does drop add? Next Friday, so we from Okay, which is when you have to have your teams formed by anyway, so um, hopefully that will help too. All right, anything else? Yes, so when I get back on the 9th, um, either you should have a team if you don't have a team and there are people, you know, scraggling around, then we'll try to pull something together and set some ground rules. Um, but yeah, I'd encourage you to take these two weeks to reach out and try to form your team in that period of time. Okay. Well, can I just say something yeah. about the idea? Sorry, I was just like very um, startling about it, but then I feel like what I'm thinking is creating a software based description on a central platform. So if you're, um, I really think people have public policy, it'll be awesome. <laughs> um, I would love to have more people in CS, so if you're like, if you had experience with like, full stack development, um, that'd be awesome too. And yeah, <laughs> and if you have file back, I have to. That would be amazing. What's yeah. the stack? Huh? Do you know what the stack is on it? Um, I'm the baby who's in technology, but I have a pretty good idea. All right. If there's no other questions, I'll let you all go, and I'll stick up, stay up here for a little bit. <coughs>
you're sitting here on a product, um, you also don't have the capital to build things on your own. So you kind of have to go with buying off the shelf components. And then at some point, when you have enough revenue um, and you find that your vendors are really squeezing your margins, then you start building things in. Right? So yeah, I'd say go down that path. So I could, I could do that. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. It's a harder project. Yeah, cool. yeah, you just have to find teammates that make like teams. Perfect. I'm going to think about it. Okay. Um, so, cool. I apologize. It's okay. But you'll just keep up with the readings because it'll be on the quiz and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure about that. Thanks. I'm going to go get Andrew. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. But you brought up the dot and also like I haven't considered like say you broke your leg. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I asked is because my chest is like ache with this oh, okay. uh, sensitive form. I don't know whether it's, it's probably genetic in some way. It but could, most, of, most of these factors are genetic. Yeah. But the point is that there's a lot of people that have problems that are non genetic yeah. through just environmental factors. Mm -hmm. And if you like give a person a routine that is yeah. not nice, yeah. they're not going to be as happy with that. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's the only thing that's going to so what do you ultimately want to do? What does MVP look like? The what? The mobile product. Um, right now, just like the subscription service, essentially like, um, so the product is going to be based on, it's going to be like a prediction algorithm, right? So given your genetic information, so like how do you get the genetic information? 23andMe, like it's API available. So like if users of that, you think it's well, yeah. the best case So you're trying to get it as the users of 23andMe. Yeah. How many users of 23andMe?